Without fail, anywhere you come across mainstream information about Hegel's dialectics, you're given the invariable formula of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. I don't think even natural laws enjoy the level of regularity in which the two appear to follow each other. In this video, I'm going to tr claim that this is not Hegel, and moreover, it is as unhegelian as it gets. Trying to shoehorn a master formula for all things is precisely the one thing Hegel doesn't do. For a thinker that carefully tries to let the dynamical movement of thought demonstrate what it is about in its very thinking of it, it seems self-defeating to then ensconce a simple general principle which leaves out that development. First things first, Hegel does not state the dialectic in terms of thesis, antith antithesis, and synthesis. In fact, this comes from another philosopher, Fichte. Fichte was a contemporary of Hegel and influenced him greatly. But Hegel did not adopt Fichte's triadic thesis, antithesis, and synthesis outright. Now, what I'm seeing here is universally known by people who have spent some time with Hegel and German idealism. So I'm not saying anything new. I'm actually just repeating what everybody knows. Well, what everybody knows, since I keep seeing the same misattribution in as recently as yesterday. If so many people are signaling this misattribution, I think this needs to be combated with an equally powerful signaling of the correction. Otherwise, only a small cadre of scholars enjoy the real insight while everybody else are peddling this caricature. But am I being unfair? Hegel was, after all, inspired by Fichte, so something of Fichte must have made his way into his thought. Certainly, sometimes the dialectic does take a Fichtean form, but the error lies in taking this to be the general pattern. And we might add that a general pattern as such is, you know, problematic in Hegel, and there are much better candidates for that uh, with actual, tem actual textual evidence, such as the identity of identity and difference. But now let's look at some text. We'll look a bit on the Fichtian model, and then look where I think it might look like you find a corresponding model in Hegel, but as I'll try to show, this isn't really the case. In his Science of Knowledge, Fichte shows that when we try to get to the foundation of our knowledge, we run into contradiction. Here we are reminded of Kant's critique, where reason, if left to its own devices, only produces a dialectic. Dialectic for Kant counts as problematic illusions which is no knowledge at all. In Kant, we find that thought must cognize appearances to generate genuine knowledge. Very briefly. Now, Fichte points his finger at Kant and says, Well, hey Kant, did you cognize any appearances for that very theory? All you've done is conceptual work. The appearances don't directly play any role in working out the logic of knowledge, so let's just drop that. Fichte instead begins with the idea of an I, which posits its non-I, and attempts to work out just their relation. We find that Fichte writes, There can be no antithesis without a synthesis, for antithesis consists merely in seeking out the point of opposition between things that are alike. But these like things would not be alike if they had not been had not first been equated in an act of synthesis. In antithesis, per se, we abstract from the fact that they have first been equated by such an act. They are simply taken to be alike, without asking why. Reflection dwells solely on the element of opposition between them, and thereby raises it to clear and distinct consciousness. And conversely, too, there can be no synthesis without an antithesis. Things and oppositions are to be united, but they would not be opposed if they had not been so by an act of the self, which is ignored in the synthesis, so that reflection may bring them to consciousness only 
bring to consciousness only the ground of connection between them. So far as content is concerned, therefore, there are no judgments purely analytic, and by them alone we do not we do not only we not only do not get far, as Kant says, we do not get anywhere at all. So we see in Fichte a curious looking back as if it was always there of conceptual thinking. That we that while we derive the synthesis out of the thesis and the antithesis, we realize that the synthesis is actually the ground from which those distinctions first arose. Moreover, this means that clear-cut distinctions are never as clear-cut as they first present themselves. Fichte points specifically to analytic judgments and notes that there is a minimum of synthesis involved in that, namely in the act of thinking itself. So let's just look at paragraph 79 here and just see what, what Hegel actually writes. So he writes, with regards to its form, the logical has three sides. Alpha, the side of abstraction or of the understanding. Beta, dialectical or negatively rational side. And gamma, the speculative or positively rational one. And then he adds a remark. These three sides do not constitute the th three parts of the logic, but are moments of everything logically real. That is, of every concept and of everything true in general. All of them together can be put under the first moment, that of the understanding, and in this way they can be kept separate from each other, but then they are not considered in their truth. Like the division itself, the remarks made here concerning determinations of the logical are only descriptive anticipations at this point. So, on the face of it, you know, this might look like we, oh, well, they have the Fichtean model here, well, or the, we have thesis antithesis, and then synthesis, because alpha is abstraction, or of the understanding, and but which, okay, and then we have the beta, which is the negatively rational side, well, that, was, that must be antithesis, and then we have a gamma, a speculative or positively rational one, when that has to be synthesis. Now, I want to point out a few things here that what Hegel says that I think counts against that reading. So, particularly look at what he writes that all of these three moments can be put together under the first moment, that of the understanding. And in this way, they are separate from each other. And indeed, that is what we have here. Hegel has separated the three from each other. And in that sense, we're understanding them under just one of them, namely the side of abstraction. So we have abstra these three moments are themselves abstractions at this point. And as long as we separate them out like this, we're not considering them in their truth. So as they really function or as it's truly conceptualized. As Hegel also says, you know, this doesn't, these three um, separations are not strictly um, applicable in a sense of like alpha uh, belongs to being and then beta belongs to essence and then uh, beta, gamma belongs to the concept. He says that in insofar as we're thinking anything, insofar as there is a logic uh, working through anything, these three moments are interwoven and uh, working together and being co-determining each other. And then he also adds that, you know, the way he is phrasing this in these three abstractions is only as more as an anticipation rather than really explaining what's going on. So let's now look at the next bit. Next bit. So Hegel writes regarding alpha, thinking as understanding stops short at fixed determinacy and its distinctness vis-a-vis -vis other determinacies. Such a restricted abstraction counts for the understanding as one that subsists on its own account and simply is. So, what the role of the understanding here is, is that it simply attaches 
a determinacy or labels to distinct uh, entities and just stops short there. So in the Fichtean model, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, they're just laid out and we sort of don't really consider why they are connected the way they are and how they just are laid out like that. And this is the sort of the magic of, of formulas is that they're trying to um, present a lot of information in actually very little. And this case is, is super effective and Hegel is uh, not at all denouncing or condemning this. However, there is more to the story than this. This turns out to be just a moment, a, a side or an aspect. So looking now at um, paragraph 81, Beta Hegel writes, the dialectical moment is the self-sublation of these finite determinations on their own part, and they're passing into their opposites. And then he adds a lengthy remark. I'll just read this for completeness sake. So one, the dialectical taken separately on its own by the understanding constitutes skepticism, especially when it is exhibited in scientific concepts. Skepticism contains the mere negation that results from the dialectic. So two, dialectic is usually considered as an external art, which arbitrarily produces a confusion and a mere semblance of contradictions in determined concepts in such a way that it is this semblance and not these determinations that is supposed to be null and void. Whereas on the contrary, what is understandable would be true. Dialectic is often no more than a subjective seesaw of arguments that sway back and forth where basic import is lacking and the resulting nakedness is covered by the astuteness that gives birth to such argumentations. According to its proper determinacy, however, the dialectic is the genuine nature that properly belongs to the determinations of the understanding, to things, and to the finite in general. Reflection is initially the transcending of the isolated determinacy and a relating of it, whereby it is posited in a relationship but is nevertheless maintained in its isolated validity. The dialectic, on the contrary, is the imminent transcending in which the one-sidedness and restrictedness of the determinations of the understanding displays itself as what it is, that is, as their negation. That is what everything finite is, its own sublation. Hence, the dialectical constitutes the moving soul of scientific progression and it is the principle through which alone imminent coherent and coherence and necessity enter into the content of science, just as all genuine non-external elevation about the finite is to be found in this principle. So, what Hegel um, brings to attention here is that the dialectical moment is not coming from the outside, it's not something that is imposed or something that happens when you put in something else to the thing that you start out with. No. The dialectical moment is first and foremost the self-sublation of what is the case or what is being understood, what is taken to be, you know, um, this or that. So Hegel claims that something more appears or seems to be the case than what is what immediately presents itself and that uh, s certain uh, critics or uh, thinkers will want to say well well this seeming this um, you know this something that makes you know what is the case not to be the case well that has to be jettisoned that has to be wrong that can't be you know um, involved in whatever way because I have the thing in front of me whatever that thing is or whatever that uh, the ter fixed determinacy whatever um, identity that I have understood that just is what it is and there's no more to it that's that's all well Hegel says well no there's actually more to it and you don't need to look further than what it is what, you, what it is what you're working with from the start namely 
the fixed determin the, the thing you take to be the fixed determinacy turns out to involve more than what is immediately there. And dialectic spells out this movement. And Hegel phrases it wonderfully as a imminent transcending. So it's from within the fixed determinacy, from within of what is understood to be the case, that it goes beyond itself on its own account. And Hegel's um, key concept for this is the notion of the finite. So the finite doesn't really have a reality of its own. It owes its reality to the infinite in which it genuinely becomes finite because in an infinite, the finite comes to its end. But that is a separate matter. Just want to show that Hegel's logical concepts are involved here as well. Now, Hegel claims that this is this negative moment is not sporadic, is not spontaneous. It is the beginning of what constitutes uh, comprehension, because if things just stay at what they are, if things are genuinely uh, just analytic, then we wouldn't get anywhere, as Fichte, following Kant, displayed. So, there is some synthesis, uh, according to Fichte, but for in Hegel here, we aren't yet thinking of a synthesis yet. What we have is more of an instability, a self-dissolvement, what he calls self-sublation. So something is rendering itself into a moment. What we took to be the case absolutely turns out to be, well, no, not really. It's something else is um, involved in what we take to be the case, whether it's a identity or a thing or a particular concept or idea, you know, let's say the world, the world is all there is, the world just stays the world. Well, what about, you know, cognizers, people thinking about the world? And actually, we don't even experience the world as a world. What we really experience, if we follow Kant, is just appearances, distinct objects that don't really have a unity apart from the one I generate in my experience. Now, another, another thing I want to add is that there is also obviously the worry of contradictions here, mm -hmm. as Hegel writes, the semblance of contradictions, indeterminate concepts, which seems to suggest that, oh, what we take to be the case cannot just be the case, or it's involved with something else, which means that that compromises its identity, its validity and coherence. And that is potentially problematic because we just lose um, the sense in which we thought we grasped something. And so the usual um, way to deal with this is just to think of, ah, well, the contradictions just have to be negated, jettisoned. But Hegel switches the picture around a little bit. So it's rather that what appears to us what we take to be immediate, what we take to be the case, the fixed determinacy, that is the negation of the semblance or what the seeming or the appearance, whatever else is being involved. Something is immediate to us because it is that instance of immediacy has negated any mediation that is involved. But at this stage, we are... Um, paying attention to the mediation and to the fact that what we took to be the case is not really solely the case. Looking now at the next paragraph, we find Hegel writes, The speculative or positively rational apprehends the unity of the determinations in their opposition, the affirmative that is contained in their dissolution and in their transition. And then he gives us a remark to flesh this out a little bit. I'll read that as well. One, the dialectic has a positive result. Because it has a determinate content, or because it resu its result is truly not empty, abstract nothing, but the negation of certain determinations, 
which are contained in the result precisely because it is not an immediate nothing, but the result. Two, hence this rational result, although it is something thought and something abstract, is at the same time something concrete, because it is not simple formal unity, but a unity of distinct determinations. For this reason, philosophy does not deal with mere abstractions or formal thoughts at all, but only with, co only with concrete thoughts. 3. The mere logic of the understanding is contained in this speculative logic and can easily be made out of the latter. Nothing more is needed for this than the omission of the dialectical and the rational. In this way it becomes what is usually called logic a descriptive collection of determinations of thought put together in various ways, which in their finitude count for something infinite. So, looking back first at the key paragraph, Hegel writes that the speculative moment is what grasps the unity of determinations in their opposition. So this is similar to what Fichte was saying in regards to you are, at, you are understanding what is uh, identical in the, di in the difference. So in this, in this or what is like in the unlike. Um, so, but here Hegel says the affirmative, he calls it affirmative, which is contained in the dissolution and in their transition. So the fact of the first moment dissolving and turning out to be not all there is, turning out not to be as fixed as it presented itself and generating some sort of instability or movement, well, the third moment is, is uh, grasping this, just this, and it picks out a new identity in this movement and then Hegel goes on goes on to um, elaborate that this positive result is now not simply a return to the first uh, moment because we're not back at some immediacy but we have now a result so we are we are at the end of some progress or some movement we have traversed some um, some distinctions and that means that what we are working with here is not something simply uh, a, a unity or a recipe or, or um, a, a mechanical stepwise um, uh, procedure but rather what he calls a concrete unity or a um, concrete determination which means that we understand that we we were previously working with abstractions and now they are being incorporated into a unity that understands their opposition but also understands something positive in this opposition in this movement so in the first phase we have a thing that we take to be the case that this is just is what it is second movement says well no it's actually not what it is something else is the case something else obtains and and the third moment understands that the two are in play with each other but also understands that now there is something else at work here which could not be looked cannot be seen just within the parameters of the first two moments. Moreover, the third moment incorporates the other two moments as, um, as part of its own, um, you could say, comprehension or functioning. That, in fact, the concrete is made up of uh, both itself and the abstract. It's not just purely concrete. As I said in the beginning, it's identity of identity and difference, not just a uh, 
you know, identity plus or new identity, right? You have to keep the abstractions and the, the transition in view. That is what makes it concrete. Now, and then, you know, Hegel gives us a little bit of jab there at the end. So, you know, if you want to do, um, to sort of um, reduce this to just formal logic or formal thinking, we can just take away the um, negative movement and the speculative movement, or the negative moment and speculative moment, and just look at um, look at what we have in terms of distinct and self-identical units. And Hegel calls this a descriptive collection, right? Because it doesn't really tell you how we move from one to the other. It only lays them out and it doesn't include within itself mm -hmm. the account of how we move from one to the other, how it is demonstrated. The demonstration is becomes kind of like taken for granted. Just as when you're, you're doing formal logic and you have a set of premises and then there is a conclusion, it doesn't really explicate the movement whereby um, the logic is sort of functioning through those terms. And so, in, in Hegel's mind, it pretends, it's, pretends to be <laughs> something more than it is, uh, which in a, in a sense is right, only because it takes it for granted, right? It's, in, as he says, it's in their finitude count for something infinite. I think that the Fichtean model, even if it is the Fichtean model, as the caricature is being pendled uh, around and about, um, does not match what Hegel is writing here. And I think here we get uh, the most general sense of him trying to give us a formal a formalization of his entire method. There's a use in the logic and in the system more broadly. Um, um, because the it seems to me that the the uh, Fichtean model in the third moment it seems to just take the two moments together but um, in a simple unity or a synthesis right so you just you just mix them together somehow but what Hegel is is uh, saying here is that we have to keep those prior two moments in view and understand what is affirmative in their movement, their dissolution and transition and so on. And that is what the third moment is, um, what the third moment spells out, right? That this is the speculative, positively rational, right? This is the, in the insight we get when we um, understand, you know, how something functions or grasp or comprehend a concept in the Fichtean one it seems like it's too much like a we just to return this the, the synthesis looks too much like a distinct unit which is just a thesis plus but that is not what is the case in speculative moment as we have seen here in Hegel however we can glimpse that within the affirmative element in the um, speculative, there is a new, um, a new fixed determinacy emerging, right? So that becomes a collapse of the development into now a new immediacy. But that is not something that is um, spoken about here. Okay, I hope you've learned something here today. Um, feel free to uh, comment and um, let me know if you think otherwise with regards to the texts that I've looked at or um, what Fichte thinks or what Hegel thinks and what you think. Um, I will also just add one last thing and that is that, um, well, actually two more things. Uh, one is that the, 
to the thesis and thesis synthesis seems to be like a kill switch for thinking rather than encouraging thinking. So, you know, we have philosopher X and he had method XYZ, right? And that's all we need to know and then we can move on. But as we have seen here, there is really a lot of thought and depth and technical uh, complex structures involved both in Fichte and in Hegel and these quick takes seem to just um, discourage that right it is not at all the case it is a kind of violence to thinking um, but moreover it's uh, uh, worse than just like misattributing to Hegel I mean there's lots of that all about and um, uh, you know you should you should criticize and you should um, where it's where where it's due and where it's fair um, but um, here it's it plays to a sort of character of Hegel as this absolutizing totalizing thinker when really what he's after is understanding the case itself whatever that may be whatever concept or, or thing it is and trying to understand its story its development as it um, as it imminently uh, presents itself right so he's very very um, what's called presuppositionless so it's very important not to impose extraneous matter that is not there in the concept of the thing as we immediately think it and we what we do is just we let whatever fixed determinacy we begin with to dissolve and um, show that it is in fact um, just the immediate phase of something much more um, complex and mediated and that lastly I just want to say that the um, whenever somebody says the dialectic between X and Y or between A and B and you know, feudalism uh, to capitalism um, that's not really talking about dialectics as, as Hegel understands it or as far as to my mind that is um, Hegel never talks about dialectic as between things but rather um, the internal development of something um, on its own terms and this becomes evident when we just think the thing and let it let its um, determinacy uh, or like inner complexities show itself so that is not really the dialectics between is not really Hegel's thing that might be dialectics of some other sort fair enough but um, that's not really I think what Hegel is up to so thank you all for you know listening to this and I hope you have uh, learned something